archiving uh, the original episodes of the Japan Hills dub for it. Um, but uh, if uh, they were bringing back Mega Star Wars again, would you be interested in voicing Omega Sense again? Oh, totally. Totally. Yeah, that's another thing that you actually reminded me of. It's like, not only did they take the show off the air, they're not going to recoup the cost or, or anything by putting it out on video or anything because they think no one's going to buy it. They figure, you know, maybe nowadays we're, we're a streaming nation now, so everyone, you know, more so than not, will stream it from somewhere, or Viz, or do you remember what studio? I can't remember exactly. Um, no, I don't remember actually. Because last time from Mega Man Network, uh, Warrior, it used to be somewhere in Canada, I think. Mm -hmm. Blue Ocean or something? Or... Yeah, there's Ocean Group, there's Blue Water. Uh, yeah, a lot of a lot of dubs come out of there. A lot of the Gundam shows, although some of the newer ones like you know, Iron Blooded Orphans and stuff comes out of LA and everything. And you know, we're we're doing what we can, but unfortunately, you know, when we ask who's directing us on these shows, they're not in the know. You know, they say it's totally up to Cartoon Network or whoever's hosting the stream or or whatnot. So um, if you're gonna um, see uh, those episodes posted in an official capacity somewhere, definitely, if you can start a groundswell of support and convince the, the people that put this, the anime out that it's like, hey, you guys could totally make money, just, there's a, fa there's a fan following for this show. I mean, yeah, it's not, it's not like Attack on Titan levels, but it's, you know, the Mega Man audience really enjoyed this show. Right, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Huzzah! Yay! I get to talk to myself now. Kazuichi Soda. Heck yeah. Okay, let me put this down. I'm a little short. Um, I wanted to ask if you have played or watched any of the other Danganronpa games, or if you've even, like, anything like that. Here. I would hazard a guess that most voice actors probably haven't played. I have not. Even though I own a Vita and all that, it's like they make us buy our own games. The ones that we even work on, they're like, can I get a copy? I worked on this. And it's like, you got $60? I'm like, oh. So that's kind of a bummer. It's like you think, come on, throw us a bone. We worked on it. But it's like, well, we paid you to record. And that's usually the extent of what the actors will know. It's like, OK. We're a, we're a blank slate, we show up to the session, the director quickly tells us a, a quick rundown of the plot, of what our character and how they fit into the story, and then we're off and running. And the cutscenes, you know, all the dialogue with the animation, the story parts, uh, the animation is rarely done at that point when we're producing the dub. We just have the audio from the Japanese side, so we have to end up matching the timing of that and hope, fingers crossed, that the animation won't be totally out of sync when the English. So if you, if you watch the cutscenes and the English is off, the English is off, the lip sync's off. It's not our fault. <laughs> the, those elements of the production weren't available at the time. Um, yeah. So my, I have a very limited understanding of Danganronpa, and I had no idea that it would sell so well. That the fan base is like rabid about that. Yes, it is. It most definitely is. So I was super stoked to not only just be a part of the game once I found out and it came out and you saw how huge it was that the anime, you know, Funimation ended up putting those out and they brought back at least part of the cast yeah. who played in the game. So I got to come back in the anime and that was awesome. And then, um, but yeah, you know, we're told that and then we record our lines and then we go home and it kind of just goes in one ear out the other. <laughs> until it comes out, and then we're like, oh, we can talk about it now. But most of us are like, okay, beyond the title and the fact that it's out, or maybe who I'm playing, I don't know. The fans always know more than the voice actors. <laughs> okay. So that's like, so do you recommend it? Because obviously you're a fan of the series. Um, I would definitely recommend it. I mean, how could... The talent behind it, right? Like. <laughs> well, thank you. No, there's there's a fantastic cast, and uh, the people that do work on video games, and they're called localization, localizing, or doing a Western adaptation into English from a lot of these Japanese studios. The people are super duper passionate, 
and we are too. We, we want to give our very best in the studio because we don't get to rehearse. We don't get scripts or footage to look at ahead of time. So we have to be, make sure our acting skills are, are on par and improv to a degree, even though we rarely change the script. But you can do subtle intonations and little things that are hard to put in script form that help l elevate it off the page and hopefully will resonate with the audience. And fortunately, I think it has. Most definitely. So that's, that part's awesome. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a really fun, interactive game. And the characters are incredible. It's, it's a lot of fun if you get around to it. And it's one thing I do remember about it, it's a murder mystery, right? Yes. It is so, very fun. <laughs> OK. All right, a murder mystery. And we might have did, were there alternate versions of the story? Mm -mm. Okay, because sometimes when we're recording video games, we have to record multiple storylines because, you know, they, they, they fork off into different tangents, you know, because there's replay value yeah. and all For that. For this one, it's, you get to like the trial and either you succeed or you fail. And if you fail, you have to like restart, basically. Oh, okay. So it's one of those. Okay. All right, cool. It's, yeah. Well, sweet. And these games are on PlayStation 4? Yes, they are. Okay, cool. Yeah, that's where I got it, so. <laughs> it's like, I have a Vita, but I'm more of a PlayStation person and a Switch, you know? Yeah. I, think, I think every game should be on Switch now. Yeah, seriously. And all that. <laughs> but cool. Yeah, thank all you right. so much. You're welcome. Thank you. So hi, everybody. Welcome. Everybody's walking in. I'm Kyle Hebert. I'm a voice actor from Los Angeles. Started on Dragon Ball Z 19 years ago. Oh my gosh. How many people are younger than 19 in this room right now? <gasps> I'm old. Whew. Yeah. So yeah, I started on Dragon Ball Z. And that led to Yu Yu Hakusho, Blue Gender, Full Metal Alchemist. And then 2005, I moved from Texas to Los Angeles, and I get on to Naruto, Bleach, Gurren Lagann, Street Fighter, Fire Emblem, Pokemon Origins, uh, a, lot of, a lot of cool properties. It's, it's, it's really neat. Uh, and this is like the coolest job in the world, guys. It really is. And it, it, it's a lot of work, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. I mean, you hear all the cliches. 10 years to become an overnight sensation. It's like, I say that half jokingly. It's like, I'm not an overnight sensation. I'm not a sensation to begin with. I'm just someone who is so passionate about this career that I'm still sticking to it because it's a freelance gig. You know, freelance people, you don't know where the next paycheck's coming from. And it's scary. At least with a, a full time job or even a part time job, you have like guaranteed hours, right? We don't have that. We don't have a guaranteed pay rate because different things pay differently. Video games pay roughly $200 an hour. Anime is way harder to do, and it pays, in the L.A. area, roughly $75 an hour. We're hoping to change the stigma that, that the dubbing thing has because that the dub rate has always been low, and we're trying to change that perception. And It's like we want people to understand the process, understand that... It is a technical skill and not everyone can do it. And we're not saying that we're awesome and we're better than you. It's not anything about ego or anything that. It's like it's a very specific skill set. Um, and there's plenty of people with great acting chops and great acting experience. And then they get in the booth and the dubbing process freaks them out because there's beep, 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 do the line. The beeps are the starting gun, you know, pew, 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 you know. It's like, how do you know when to start? You have to match the, the lip sync, right? And you're acting, and you're doing a character voice, and you have to commit to it until the director tells you differently. And your job as the actor is to please the director, AKA the client, or the client who is above the director. Sometimes those clients, someone is representing the client, and they're in the recording booth for the games. For anime, once in a while, maybe someone will be there for the first session to help establish the tone and make sure that once you start recording the character, that they're like, all right, you're good. Uh, and then, you know, we're, we're in this little vacuum 
You know, it's like I have no idea what the feedback's going to be until it's unleashed on the public. You know, all I know is I go in, record, sign a non-disclosure agreement, you know, an NDA, which means don't talk about it, don't tweet about it, don't say anything, or else we can fine you or make sure you never work again. So there's that. But the thing I love about voice acting is you're not limited by your appearance. Your appearance doesn't play any role in the career. It doesn't matter what you look like. So I always think it's funny that voice actors have headshots. It's like, here's what we look like. Doesn't matter. Because 99% of the roles I get look nothing like me. They aren't my age. I'm like 50 in a couple weeks, but I'm still voicing a 20-something. Gohan, Dragon Ball Super, and yeah, I voiced Kiba all these years on Naruto. Aizen's a relatively young guy. He looks like he's in his 30s or something. So there's that. It's very freeing. Not having to be on a set for 12 plus hours a day, waiting for lighting equipment and shots to get set up and wardrobe and makeup and all that stuff, a bunch of waiting around. You go into a recording session, it's very focused. We need you for two hours. You go in, you record, you sign some papers, you go home. A couple weeks later, your paycheck shows up in the mail. The end. So we're hired and fired at you know, the beginning and the ending of a project. And just in nicer terms. You know, it's like, do I die? I'm like, yes. Like, oh. So it's always nice to have job security. You're like, my guy didn't die on Dragon Ball Z. Not so much on Gurren Lagann. It's not a spoiler. It's been over 10 years. <laughs> My guy's just sleeping. He's just very tired. So there's that. I've, uh, I've been... I've, I've totally enjoyed uh, getting to work in this career because uh, it's something I've been passionate about since I was probably eight or nine years old, watching cartoons, classic Warner Brothers Looney Tunes, man. Learning that one guy, Mel Blanc, voiced those characters, that's a, you know, that cemented the idea in my head that I wanted to do that. Also, when I was a kid, I was shy, but I also was enamored with the idea of being a DJ on the radio. I thought that like introducing records and all that and being that disembodied voice who could, you know, basically control what you hear. <laughs> Maybe it's a control thing, I don't know. But I thought it was cool, so I used to do that. I would take my records on my turntable and I'd take a cassette recorder and I'd play a fake radio station and I'd do fake commercials and parody voices and, and, and silly voices and stuff. And I didn't think it would actually lead to something one day. Then I go to college and I get a broadcasting degree, a radio TV film they used to call it, now they think they call it media arts, at the University of North Texas, which is an hour outside of Dallas. It's in this college town, Denton, Texas. Um, so I went there, got a Bachelor of Arts. Through college, I got an internship at a radio network. And at the radio network, that turned into a job. So I went from being a gopher and behind the scenes unpaid to being on the air. And I was voicing top 40, country, heavy metal, not all at the same time over the course of time. It's like, wow, I'm, I'm playing big band swing from the 40s. And then next thing you know, I'm introducing Metallica. Fast forward a few months, I'm introducing Britney Spears because uh, I'm on Radio Disney. Right from the very beginning, 1996, they launched on Mickey and Minnie's birthday. And Radio Disney's still a thing today. They're just online. They used to be on AM radio stations. But yeah, so I was in Radio Disney and uh, heard about auditions at Funimation through some radio station coworkers. Went in, tried out, and you know, I was already a fan of Dragon Ball Z. That started in the mid-90s. If anyone here is old enough to remember, the Ocean dub, the Canadian English version, First started airing those first two sagas over and over again. First, before Toonami even, on independent stations at like 4 or 5 a.m. on a Saturday morning. I actually had to break down and learn how to program my VCR. Remember VCRs, guys? Remember videotapes? Ancient technology. 
This is before the internet. What? This is before cell phones. What? Well, cell phones were just starting to come out. Back then, a cell phone was probably the size of a brick. And yeah, it was super duper expensive. It was, it was like a luxury item only the rich could afford. Like, hmm, internet, what's that? And now everything's come out and everything's like streaming format now and, and the fans have pretty much dictated the business model, the change. Uh, so now you're getting a lot of things that come out pretty much simultaneously. Not every show, but a lot, especially on the Funimation side, come out in English and pretty much at the same time come out in Japanese, you know, maybe vice versa, the Japanese first and then maybe a week or two later, English version, which is unheard of. If you go back to the 90s or the 80s or the 70s, the dark ages before it was called anime, you never would have thought. It's like, these shows are so old and they're just now getting here. Like Naruto was a thing well, at least five years before the English dubs started. And now that window is shortening, which is nice. You know, you guys don't have to wait as long. And people don't feel like their only option is to go torrent or pirate it somewhere. And, uh, you know, that's, that, that's cool that the studios are working together and kind of understanding that the Internet is not going away. You're not going to be able to get rid of um, piracy altogether, but you will satisfy a thirst and a hunger that a lot of the fans have. They're not doing it to be malevolent or be jerks about it. They just want their show now. And, you know... A lot of the studios are now working with American studios to make sure that that happens or that, that that gap shortens. A great example also is like the Dragon Ball Z movies of the past few years. Battle of Gods came out in English a year after the Japanese. Resurrection F came out six months after. And then the Broly movie, so like only a month or two tops. So God knows the next one. Maybe it'll debut worldwide in the same day in multiple languages, whatever. It'll be localized for the world to appreciate, and that's awesome. So that's pretty neat. I'm just blabbing. Don't mind me. This is a really a free-form kind of panel, so if you guys have questions, there's a mic right here. I have a question. Okay. Since you were taking us on such a nice walk down memory lane in the 90s. Yes. Um, so my husband's been a fan of Dragon Ball Z since the 90s, obviously. And yeah. I, on the other hand, I'm kind of a late bloomer. I just kind of got started. So, but my favorite character is Gohan. Has nice. Been so for a long time. So um, my question was, my understanding is that a lot of people are very disappointed with, you know, the direction that his character taking, especially after the Cell Saga, like yeah. all the lack of potential that was unused. And so, um, although I feel like they showed a little bit in Super, you know, being that you are behind this character, where would you like to see him go if they continue the series? Well, you know, if, if I had my druthers, man, that Gohan would get his day. He would come back and show something past all these other power-up levels, and he's going to show his true potential. And maybe, maybe that is in the back of Akira Toriyama's mind. Maybe Gohan will have his day. And, you know, he got ignored totally in the Broly movie. He's not even in it. It's like... We're to believe that he's just going to go off and just be a family guy now and never help the planet. Yeah, That's hard to believe because <laughs> I get that he's smart and he's a bookworm. He's a good dad because Goku wasn't really <laughs> Piccolo's his dad. Let's just face it, you know. So, yeah, I was bummed when I found out that, you know, this, this pivotal moment in Gohan's existence, it's all been going up here and then he gets absorbed by Majin Buu and then he's kind of like demoted to mm -hmm. meh. Well, boo. But I mean, I still had fun doing, you know, Say a Man and all that, kind of the Jar Jar Binks of Dragon Ball Z. But, but strangely, every con signing that I do, there's, there's some intense love for Say a Man, so that makes me happy. It's like, I know he's silly and dorky and all that, and I love that about Gohan, because he's strong and pure, naive, inherently good, but also a badass. Mm -hmm. You know, he has all those multiple facets to him, so that's why it's always very um, satisfying to get to voice him. And now, you know, I'm still working on the Tournament of Power stuff on Super, so he's still showing his fighting side, which is great. Now, 
where it goes in the future, we're all waiting with bated breath. It's like, do we want to see more Gohan, Vegeta power levels? Or are we, we're, we're good, we're good. Can we see Gohan go somewhere? That'd be nice. I'm ready. <laughs> I'm beyond ready. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Some people, some people misunderstand that Kid Gohan was voiced by someone else. Originally, Stephanie Nadolny in Texas. I think Monica Story in, in Canada, Kid Gohan. But Kid Goku and Kid Gohan for the Funimation dub of Dragon Ball and Z was Stephanie Nadolny. And if you've been playing the games for the past few years, Colleen Clinkenbeer took over Kid Gohan and Kid Goku. So it just depends on which version you're watching. I took over Gohan when he goes to high school. So it's definitely after the Cell Saga and all that, in case there's any confusion, because I end up signing a lot of autographs on Team Gohan stuff, and I get it because that's the most pop the version that fought Cell is the most popular version of Gohan. I, I get that. But it's like, come on, let's give grown up Gohan a little love. I mean, yeah, he's got some Saiyan Man figures and all that, but the Funko Pops, it's all kid Gohan. Like, oh, come on, guys. That's completely selfish of me, I know. But it's like, ah. I have a question again. Um, yeah. Well, since you voice a character Ryu, are you uh, experienced playing as Ryu in any games like Street Fighter or Super Smash Bros.? Have I done what now? Are you experienced playing as Ryu in Super Smash Bros. or Street Fighter? I am terrible. I'm a button masher. I'm a casual gamer at best. I can't remember combos to save my life. So I do better at Marvel vs. Capcom because at least you get like a 50-50 shot if you just like, yeah, I'm randomly punching buttons. And then I find out if I accidentally stumble across a move, I will spam it. Can I play you sometime? Can you play me sometime? I don't know. If you happen to find me on, on PlayStation, it's like I, I, I have a lot of friends, but I don't end up playing online with other people. I just kind of like anonymously kind of go on and play Call of Duty and get killed all the time and play fighters. I do play as myself on that. I play Ryu on Street Fighter. And I that. was kind of expecting a sure you can, sure you can, you know. And the, that's a monkey said You know, it's like, they had to speed that up. The first time you hear, like, hurricane kick, they decided to keep that with a Japanese name. So I said it as fast as I could. They still sped it up. So it sounds kind of robotic if you play Street Fighter 4. That's a monkey said You know, like, so I can't just say hurricane kick. But a Hadouken, it's fireball. That doesn't sound as cool, does it? Like, fireball! <laughs> but Hadouken... It's neat to see, you know, not only did he got to have a, a little moment in Street Fighter, and then he had, or sorry, Wreck-It Ralph, he got to have a moment in Wreck-It Ralph, and, you know, he got a, a shout out, Ryu showed up, and they had a Hadouken line in uh, Ready Player One. I've seen sitcoms and shows where they do a little Street Fighter references, and it's like, wow, that's cool. And all that. And it goes back to this gaming series. It's been around for decades that I didn't, well, I did, had nothing to do with until 2008. But yeah, I bet you're good though. Well, only in Smash Brothers. Oh, you're good at Smash Brothers? I'm, I'm awful. I'm probably worst of all at Smash Brothers. I'm not a Ryu main, but I can actually play a little bit of Ryu. Yeah. I mean, the coolest thing that I get, I mean, when I see a game come out that I want to play, if I'm a playable character, that is like the most fun. I, get, I, I love to play as my character. But a lot of my characters aren't playable. Like I found out that I was in Red Dead Redemption 2. I'm just a background character. And how do I know that? It's because someone tweeted a shot of the credits. When I recorded, they didn't tell me what I was working on. They were that secretive that they wouldn't tell me. I just show up, do a handful of lines, I'm done in like 20 minutes. And off I go. That was so weird. Same thing happened with Days Gone. It's like, I'm on that? News to me. That'll happen a lot. So if a game or show comes out and you see that I'm on it and you tweet at me, chances are that's the first time I'm hearing about it. <laughs> so I'll end up retweeting you because it's like, hey, thanks for the heads up. Or someone says, great job on such and such game. And I quickly go to GameStop.com and say, like, is this out yet? Available now. Okay, good. I can talk about it. 
Because some stuff gets leaked early, and it's like, I can't talk about it till it comes out. I can't confirm or deny. I'm just sitting here, minding my own business. So yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi. Hello. So going back to Dragon Ball, mm -hmm. Dragon Ball Z, super. What is your favorite scene with Gohan? What is your favorite scene that you voiced? Favorite scene that I voiced with Gohan was in the Other World Tournament when he goes Super Saiyan 2 and his eyes flip back in his head and he's like yelling and, and um, golly, they're just blown away by it. The tournament tiles are levitating and it's the first time you're seeing a, an older version of Gohan doing that move. And, you know, I got to do it for that. And it's like, that's so cool. The animation was really cool. And then we did it again for Kai all these years later. I was worried. It's like, I'm so much older now. I don't know if I can hit that note, hit that and scream that long. But I was able to do it. it took two takes, but, you know, we got there. So I don't know how many people have, have given Dragon Ball Z Kai a chance. But I think the acting is way better because the cast has so much more experience since those early days. Dragon Ball Z was like our, a lot of our first show. And if we go back and watch a clip on YouTube, it's like we're wincing because it's like, oh, it's so stiff, it's so wooden. It's like, ah. But, so there's I mean, two different versions of it. Oh, yeah. Kai is a, a remastered, so the animation looks cleaner, uh, and a, a new script that is new in Japanese and is faithful in the dub to the Japanese script. There's a little more censorship in it, but again, I think the performances are stronger so from she everybody. Prefer, she prefers the uh, Kai, I prefer Z. Oh, sure, yeah, yeah, because you know, you're watching it thinking that they're gonna trim the fat, take all the, all the filler arcs out, and then you, know, you think you're given the best of all worlds, like the fights are more concise, it addresses that issue that every fan has had a problem with. It's like, I love this show, but really? 75 episodes of like powering up, you know, like, uh, how much time has passed? 30 seconds? Like, exactly. Thank you. But you can't win them all, but that's okay. So again, that, that's my pitch out there. It's like, just put on an episode, a random episode of, of DBZ Kai. You may still prefer what you watched initially, um, but I say, just kind of examine it from an acting standpoint. There's just a handful, like three or four roles got recast. You know, there's a different Frieza. Nowadays, it's Chris Ayers. Uh, you know, back then it was Linda Young. Uh, the narrator's different. I was the narrator on Dragon Ball Z. On Kai and Super is Doc Morgan, a local Dallas DJ. So it's like a couple things are different. But I got to keep my other roles, darn it. Hi there. Uh, over your career, how has the dubbing process changed in any way, technologically or finding a contract? The dubbing process has not really changed from the time I started, other than we went from broadcast beta and a physical tape to QuickTime video. So our ability to do a take over and over again is much faster. We're able to get a lot more done in a lot quicker time. So we're also expected to get more done in, in a quicker amount of time. Back then, you, you were expected to do about 20 lines an hour. You'd be doing good because it takes so long for the tape to queue up to just the right moment. But nowadays, yeah, you blow a take, they can instantly snap right to the exact frame with a quick time file so the quality is much better. You don't have to worry about the machine eating the tape because that happens on every level or the machine breaking down. Uh, we've always recorded on Pro Tools, the recording software. That's what musicians use. It's what movie editor, TV editors use. And we do it for voiceover, too. Um, there are different ways of dubbing shows. Uh, the, and uh, Sentai down in Houston, they use, like, the chase method. They basically watch it and kind of say the lines as it's going along. I'm used to the beep method, where it's beep, 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 say the line. There's a newer one now that's kind of like karaoke. Uh, it's called a Rhythmo Band or something like that, uh, invented by the French, apparently. But it's a system by which you see the picture and along the bottom, the words come, like lyrics. And there's this red bar, for example. And when the, when the words hit the bar, that's when your character starts talking. I like that. I think that's the most fun. 
it weirds some people out and they hate it. Some people, you know, I, I'm used to, I think you get a lot more done with that newer method, more so than the beeps, but you know, we're, we're trying different things out in the studio. So it's, it's neat to see it watch. I mean, nowadays, industry-wise, auditions, a lot more auditions are done from home. The actual recording session, though, we will physically go into a studio for the most part. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, sure thing. Hi there. Hi. Oh, Tom. Oh, well, this will be okay. Um, I recently learned that voice actors don't always uh, record in the studio together. So I was wondering how you um, record voice lines, well, voice lines where you're interacting with another character when the other person isn't there. This kind of goes back to actors being trained and, and, and honing that skill to be able to play off someone who isn't necessarily there. Like, we'll record a scene, we have to record by ourselves because of the technical constraints of matching lip sync and all that. Okay. It's a budgetary issue, okay. you know. You can't really record multiple people unless it's like a cartoon, like Family Guy or something. You can have everyone in the room recording, that's the most fun. Because <laughs> the animation's not done yet, they're going to animate to you. Anime, the animation is done, it can't be changed, it's locked in. So. We're, we're, we're constrained by whatever the animation is, so we have to match lip sync. That's a very specific sort of thing. So we do it one at a time. Um, and you have to just get used to the fact that your character may be playing off someone else who hasn't recorded yet, or if they have, you can ask the director or the engineer to play that in your headphones so you can get a feel for that. But we're usually previewing each line in Japanese anyway. We're seeing the script for the first time as we're going down the script, and then we're previewing it, watching in Japanese, so I'm kind of reading along, I'm seeing the lead in line by the other person. It's like, oh, they're asking a question, so I'm answering in mine, and that, that happens a lot. And sometimes there's parts where everybody says the same exact thing at the same exact time, and if no one has recorded that yet, then someone has to be the first, so they get to lay down the groundwork. So if, say, I have to say, Sir, yes, sir, and no one's recorded it yet, and I'm the first one to record it, that's great. I can say it however I want, as long as it matches the lip sync. The other people that come in, they have to listen to my voice track, and then they might play it while they record them at the same time to make sure that was, sir, yes, sir. We have to say it at that exact rhythm, and then we build it as each actor comes in to record those parts, <coughs> record the main cast, or whoever's available, record bit parts, or walla, Smaller stuff, the background characters that aren't named, they are in the script, like Man A, Man B, and all that stuff. But yeah, that's kind of what goes on there. Okay, thank you. Yeah, sure, thank you. <coughs> What's up? I don't know if you can hear me, because, okay, cool. Hey, what's up? Um, uh, I was wondering if that you wish that Gohan got some light in the Broly movie, that he wasn't so done dirty and not really in it. Since oh, God, you know, yeah. I wish Gohan was in it. I wish he had like a moment, like say hi, do something, because they don't even address where he is. I mean, yeah. is there anything in Super that says, hey guys, I'm gonna go home and raise my kid, or anything to, to it's like, because Broly takes place right after Super, uh -huh. right? Uh -huh. So it's like, I'm confused. He was done dirty, you were done dirty. Yeah, I know, hopefully he'll have his day. We're waiting. Yep, right, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Next. So up until I was attending this convention, I thought your last name was Herbert. I know, it looks like Herbert. So my question is, does that happen a lot for you? Do names like on your diploma or driver's license get mix, misspelled? Because well, my last name, Hellman, that happens to me all the time, no matter how much paperwork I send in. That's never happened on my license because, you know, I spell it. Uh, they, they luckily just haven't messed it up. My last name, Bear, is Louisiana French. And A bear is pronounced where the H is silent and the E is pronounced like an A. And the E-R-T is like Stephen Colbert. You know, looks like Colbert. So A bear is the actual name. People outside of Louisiana rarely know that unless maybe they're a sports fan and they know of Bobby A bear, who's a football player. No relation, by the way. Um, but A bear is a very common name in Louisiana. What I get a lot is Hebert or Herbert. 
Hebert is a real name. Herbert is a real name. Neither are my name. But I've heard it so much my whole life that sometimes I don't bother correcting people. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. My, my name will get misspelled a lot on hotel reservations, on, um, on badges and program guides, even ones that I've been a guest at for many years. I'm like, really, guys? But they got it right. They got it right. This is my third time here, by the way. So, awesome. Hi. Hi. I uh, just wanted to say that um, I think, like most of us, I'm sad I didn't get to see Tracksuit Gohan with Vegeta and Goku fighting Broly, because he would have fit in perfectly for that. I would even take that. I mean, I wasn't a fan of Tracksuit <laughs> Gohan, but... Um, it was fine once the glasses came off. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> whew. Um, I'm cool but, again. My question is, is, we know that you really like the Super Saiyan 2 transformation um, yeah. when he was an adult at the tournament, but were there any blooper moments that have stuck with you over the years? Like anything with Saiya Man or... Um, probably one I can't do in company because it's not an 18 plus panel. <laughs> but a lot of us will, you know, there's cussing that goes on when we flub a line. So I've flubbed lines as the narrator before. And with the narrator, because he's not an on-screen character, you have timing. You know, he's got to say this line by this certain point in the time code on the screen, or it cuts to black, like, next time on Dragon Ball Z, and the screen cuts to black. That's where the credits go. <coughs> so I've recorded, like, next time on Dragon Ball, it cuts to black, and then Dragon Ball, beep, you know, like, don't. There are hours and hours and hours of blackmail audio. Let me just put it out there. All the, all the fight reactions out of context sound totally wrong. <laughs> That's one way of putting it. Thank yeah, you. Uh, yeah. Ton, tons of bloopers out there. You know, uh, sometimes people try to, you know, they'll try to stifle a burp or a fart, and it just comes out in the mics. They're powerful. They hear everything. <laughs> so, yeah, that happens. Thank you. Yeah, sure thing. Hey. Hey. Um, I wanted to know your thoughts of like working in blue gender and like it's just such a bizarre anime. What made you want to work in that? Well, the one thing they wanted me to work on blue gender was the fact that it was a project and they wanted to hire me. <laughs> it's like, oh, this pays. Now they had me audition for several roles. I ended up being like uh, Seno Miyagi, who yeah. is this main bad guy who basically explains what is actually going on. He kind of looks like uh, uh, Gendo Ikari in Evangelion, he kind of looks similar to him. Yeah. But the show to me kind of seemed like, it's like Starship Troopers, only serious and not campy. Yeah, but the, uh, um, yeah, yeah, like I didn't honestly know anything about the show other than when Chris Sabat said, hey, we're gonna have you audition for this. Have you heard about it? And like, no, I have no idea what this is. What is it? It's totally polar opposite of Dragon Ball. <laughs> totally opposite of Yu Yu Hakusho. This is completely like serious sci-fi horror type stuff and like, cool, I don't let's know. do this. When I watched that, I just couldn't take it seriously. It was just like so random. Like there's just like a random scene just because. Yeah, there's <laughs> random over the top violence or, or adult situations. Just out of nowhere. And like giant pods that look like alien Brussels sprouts. And I'm like, what is this? I have a term that I use whenever something just makes you go, what the, you know, I just say, oh, Japan. If you have a hard time trying to capsulize what a plot of something or what in a scene is happening, or you find yourself laughing when you actually say the words of what is happening in the scene, oh, Japan. <laughs> you. Thanks. That's his Clint Eastwood moment. Do people remember Clint Eastwood? Back in the day. <clears throat> so, um, Gohan is my favorite character. And, um, awesome. I mean, any, every version of him, kid, teen, even adult Gohan. Great. And I think that had to do a lot with me being introduced to Dragon Ball Z before yeah. Dragon Ball. So I mm -hmm. kind of grew up with Dragon Ball Z. Um, in your opinion, do you feel like the Dragon Ball Z as a franchise would have, its popularity would have affected in any way if Dragon Ball was aired before Dragon Ball Z in the US? Uh, well, I mean, the way that it actually worked out is DBZ aired first, and then Dragon Ball. Dragon Ball didn't get nearly the ratings, but I understand why, because the show's tone is, like, more comedy-based. Z is all action. 
And the ratings were what the ratings were. More people were interested in the action more so than the comedy. There are Dragon Ball's ardent defenders who are like, no, Dragon Ball's a much better show. But, I mean, again, it's humor over... I mean, there's lots of humor, obviously, in Z and, and everything, and Super and everything, but it's, <laughs> it's a lot of... It's like, oh, it's a little more South Parkish in Dragon Ball. These little kid versions, it's like, these shows aren't kid shows. They kind of look like they would be, but they're really not. So, would it have made a difference had Dragon Ball aired first? I don't know. I think if Dragon Ball aired first... I don't know that the ratings would be well enough that they'd go ahead and say, yes, let's go ahead and license Dragon Ball Z. And then we'd be like, what is that? What is this strange show? Fortunately, it's different now with the internet. People are, are learning about things a lot faster. And, you know, the studios are listening to what the fans want and they're learning what shows they want to get licensed and what ends up. And now all the streaming platforms are investing in titles like Netflix and Prime and Crunchyroll and Funimation, Viz, everybody. So it's like the best time in the world to be a fan right now. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> sure. Hi. Hi. Sorry, a little nervous. No, um, what's wrong? <laughs> um, my question is, I was looking over your dub career, and I have to say it's just so, it's so long, it's so amazing. You have all these different characters. Was Thank there you. one that you really, really, I mean, they're all great, but... Did you have one in particular that you liked voicing that was super extra funny or what, which one stuck out to you? Uh, well, Gohan, I wouldn't have a career without Gohan. Oh. That's led to everything. So there'll sure. always be a special place in my heart. Dragon Ball Z started as a fan. Then I ended up working on the show five years later. Like what? Awesome. That's wild. That's led to everything. Uh, other things like the one I had the most fun voicing is Ox King. I wish he had more to do. Like, oh boy, uh, Gigi's getting married. You know, He's basically Macho Man Randy Savage, but a derpy version. <laughs> Ooh, step into a Slim Jim. Ooh, yeah. You know, love doing that voice. Wish I had more excuse to do that voice. I love being uh, Ryu in Street Fighter because that led to a cameo in Wreck-It Ralph. And it's just 10 seconds, but it's like, hey, I got to be in a Disney movie and I'm not a big celebrity. Yeah. It's like, this is awesome. So, yeah, there's, and Kamina has made such a, a powerful impact on people with Gurren Lagann, such a positive character that that show has helped people with a hard time in their life and they're dealing with depression or something and helps turn things around, literally. So that's like icing on the cake to hear that not only did I entertain them with, with stuff that I've worked on, but I made a difference in their life. That is amazing to hear. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hey there. Hello. Hi. Oh, God. Uh, my question is just, whenever you're doing a voice line, uh, what goes through your head? Like, you know that point where Videl was getting smacked by the twin? Uh, when you become Gohan, uh, you have to pretend to be angry. Like, what goes through your mind to get into the emotion? Like, uh, like how do you pretend to be angry? Like you yelling and everything, how do you get in the moment? See, it's weird because a, a lot of people come from an, a stage background and there's different techniques to acting. You know, you hear about one called method where you're basically, you know, you're channeling some sort of memory that helps guide you towards that emotion. I have found that I don't really need to do that. I'm just able to kind of snap into the zone. Uh, I don't know, that, I mean, that you call that a technique. I don't really have any like warm up regimen like ma 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 me 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 me. You know, there's people that do all sorts of like, you know, warm their voice up with making silly sounds. And I, I don't do any of that stuff. So it's like I'm kind of amazed sometimes that I have a career. Like you, don't, you don't think about something that makes you mad or sad? No, no. I just make sure that, you know, whatever I see visually, that I'm trying to match the intensity, you know, because. At least I have a visual cue that can tell me, it's like, is it over the top, you know, the mouth opens big and wide, or is it a little more like seething, like gritted teeth sort of thing? And then you're hearing the performance in Japanese too. That's also a big guide. So, yeah, that most of the time I'm using the Japanese, the source animation, the source audio track, unless the director says, let's make this something a little bit different or subtle instead of over the top. You know, you have a little more freedom when it doesn't show the character on screen. 
Maybe they're speaking, but they're cutting away to someone else, or it's panning across and showing the background or something, and there's narration or something. That's a chance that, that, that opens it up for a little more, like, oh, I can put a little more of my stamp on this now, you know? All right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, how you doing? Hi, good. Um, I was looking on Google, and it says that you're Kakuin from JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. Kakuin, yeah, Stardust Crusaders, yeah. What do you think about the whole series in general? I haven't seen any of it. Oh. Believe it or not, I've only seen my parts that I've dubbed. I haven't seen the dub yet. Uh huh. Do you do your own Nero Nero? Sorry? Do you do your own Nero Nero? You know what that scene is with the cherry? Uh, yeah, we, we watched it, we previewed it in Japanese. Yeah. And I, would, I saw it before I dubbed it, <laughs> like months ahead, because I knew it was a meme, and I just watched yeah, yeah, it, yeah. and it's like, and it's like, what are we going to do on the dub version? <laughs> and then I saw the script, and it said, lick, 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 lick. it's like, really? <laughs> okay. All right, man. That was it. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Emerald Splash. I remember. I said, that sounds like a drink. It is. It's an alcoholic drink. Uh, I, I remembered one when I sat down. <laughs> nice. Uh, so we, Kamino has had like a huge impact over the years since Gurren Lagann came out. Yeah. Right? Uh, did he leave any impact on you your last day you had to record? Or were you not quite aware of how well he was going to resonate with everyone? Um, Tony Oliver directed that dub and he told me before I even recorded episode one and he said, don't get attached to this character. <laughs> and I'm like, really? It's like, but he's a fan favorite and he's beloved and all that. So it became all the more important for me to really do justice for this character. So yeah, it, it, would, it would it hit me a little emotional. It's like, I'm not crying, you're crying. <laughs> Darn onions. It's like, yeah, I couldn't help but get a little, a little misty eyed when I'm getting to the end of it. Um, and then I come back as a flashback in a couple of episodes, like the last episode, uh, that maybe a couple other short little glimpses of him, basically inspiring Simone. Um, but yeah, it's like, I, I knew that that show had a following a whole year before we got to dub it. Uh, for whatever reason, ADV at the time, Sentai now, but they were known as ADV Films in Houston, had the rights to it. They had the first volume recorded, produced, and then it got yanked for what, I have no idea why. The license ended up in the air, ended up in Aniplex. And then the LA cast got, got to do it. Um, so I knew that it had a huge fan, fan following. And then we had the pressure of having to crank it out twice as normally, uh, twice as fast as would normally be expected because Sci-Fi Channel just got a broadcast deal to air it. Is that where you first saw the English yeah, dub? Yeah, I, I remember it pretty clearly. It was, I remember seeing it and thinking, oh, that's weird, there's anime on sci-fi. Yeah, sci-fi <laughs> channel for a while was pretty cool before they started doing Mansquito and Sharknado and all these god-awful movies. You know, they had an anime block and for whatever reason, they said, let's put Gurren Lagann on. And they did it, did well. They re-ran re it several times. So yeah, thank you for watching. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Hi. Uh, Hi. Thanks for coming out here. Thank you. Um, so I've heard from other voice actors here before that even if you are a longtime actor for a particular character, you don't necessarily get preferential treatment to do it again if they come back. So I'm just curious, what was it like hearing Supers coming back and going for Gohan again? Um, well, I was super happy that, you know, I was basically told by Chris Sabat, who's directed all of Z since the beginning for the most part, that... I would get to be Gohan from here on out. So I wasn't really concerned that I would get replaced necessarily. The narrator thing he felt bad about, I felt bad, but I mean, I also moved to Los Angeles. I used to be in Dallas and at the time uh, with Dragon Ball Kai, they said it just would have been cost prohibitive. Anime pays crap. And then you know, you'd have to fly out once a week to record. It's like, it's just not worth it. So. We feel that each Dragon Ball saga has its own narrator anyway. So I thought, ah, okay. So at least I got to keep Ox King and, and Gohan most importantly. So that was awesome. It would, it would hurt if he got replaced. I was concerned as the Broly movie was starting to get recorded 
that maybe I got replaced, and then I found out, oh, he's just not in it. I'm no, like, Toriyama still just doesn't care. You think, is that, has he gone on record saying that he doesn't care? No, I, I, I've never seen anything like that. It just feels that way for people that like Gohan. Yeah, yeah. I know he, he's gotten the shaft for, for so many years. I mean, he Someday. got to play a little during Super, and that's better than nothing, but he's still not showing his true potential. Someday. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hi again. Hi again. Um, I just wanted to give you a quick thank you because I am somebody with a learning disability. I have dyslexia and reading subtitles is actually impossible for me. So the fact that you're a dub and you dub a ton of anime and stuff, it means the world to me and a lot of other people out there who can't actually read subtitles. And I wanted to make sure that you heard that. Thank oh, you. That's very yeah. sweet. Thank you. So thank you for letting me enjoy something so great. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you. It's great to, to make a positive impact on people. It's like I so don't get why the sub-dub debate still exists in 2019. It's just like trollers be trolling, yo. It's like don't feed the trolls. I would think that if you created something for the world to enjoy, that however that story gets told, you'd be thrilled that it found a fan base whether it's in its native language or if they're watching subtitles in their own language to watch it in your original language. I mean, whether you're an artist or an animator or an actor or just a creator. I don't think the sub-dub thing is an issue. It shouldn't have been ever since DVD was invented. Like 96, 97, you know, when you could pick 99% of anime that came out, hey, you had a choice. Just pick the audio track you want to watch. And you know, it's like, why do you guys change it in English? It says this on the subtitles. There's a technical reason for that. There's only so many mouth flaps. You have to honor the translation, but you know, you also have to fit the flap. Plus, you know, at the end of the day, there have been controversial decisions on pronunciations. I've, there's been stuff on Bleach that we think we were saying it wrong, but Viz said, say it like this. And it's like, really? Okay. And the fans are like, why do you call it that? I'm like, we were told to say it that way. <laughs> it's like, we are at the mercy of the client. It's their show. That's why shows have ended up censored on Cartoon Network. That's why four kids infamously got their bad rap because the Japanese wanted to get those shows on TV, kids TV, and they had to make compromises. They okay, they approved all those horrible edits that people had a problem with. So, you know, can you really blame four kids at the end of the day? I mean, other people were blaming actors. It's like, no, the actors did their job. Even if the dub is awful, the actor uh, was directed that way. The director approved the performance. The client approved the performance. It is what it is. That's kind of like saying, oh, so-and-so was terrible in this movie. It's like, well, they gave the performance that was okay. That's what got edited into the film. So it's like, make sure that if you're angry about something that it's, it's going in the right direction and constructively, by the way, constructively. Don't be a hater just to hate and all that. That's my soapbox. How are you doing? Big hey. Fan. Thank you. Um, I used to watch you in the BHS, the Dragon Ball Zs. Old school, yes. I still got them. That's great, thank you. I don't know if I'll be able to play it again, but I, I got them. Is there ever, ever a character, I know you play so many characters, but is, is there one character you turn down that you regret turning down? I've never had to turn down a character. Sometimes they'll ask, you know, and they'll be, they'll be cool about it. Studios will be like, hey, this show has violence or gore or the, question, the characters do questionable things. Are you okay with that sort of content? They give you a heads up. So that if, you know, maybe it's against your personal morals or belief or religion or whatever, you can turn down the role and you're, it's not like you're going to get in trouble or blacklisted. The studios are totally okay with that. They respect your personal space and they don't want you to be offended. You know, you don't want to be a part of a product that you yourself don't believe in, right? It's like if the character does something atrocious to another character, you know, the actor has a decision. It's like, well, do I want to put my name on that? Or do I want to do it because I need the money and I just change the name and have an alias? Or do I just not even take the job in the first place? 
And that's totally cool if someone else wants to take it and it doesn't affect their mental stability or whatever and they're okay with that, that's fine. But yeah, I, I've never had that issue. I haven't had that come up. Um, there's always tons of things that I wish I would have got cast on, things that I've auditioned for, but you know, it, it just wasn't meant to be. So that's just part of the, the thick skin mentality that you have to have when you're an actor trying out for things is chances are you're not gonna get it. It's like, that's okay, at least I'm being heard. They're considering it and they're moving on to whoever fits the bill better and that's fine. Yeah. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Hi again. Um, I just want to say that my son and I were very big fans of One Punch Man. Great. Um, we love Atomic Samurai. So um, I was wondering in terms of the dub process, I know some voice actors aren't allowed to read ahead in the manga uh, just in case they, when the script gets in front of them, they're able to do the reactions, you know, it's more of a surprise or anything. And I was just wondering in terms of that particular anime, do you read the manga? Do you read ahead in that one? Or do no. you just kind of take it as it comes? I, I don't read manga. And also, just to clear things up, we're never forbidden from reading ahead. Oh, okay. Every actor has the choice. If they want to know what's going to happen with their character and say the director knows, mm -hmm. then yeah, the director will totally inform them. Some actors like to make the discovery as wow. the character discovers it, so they feel that their performance is more natural. Oh. I'm cool with knowing general generalities. It's like, okay, I know commune is important. It's like, does he live? No? Okay. <laughs> well, that's okay, but now I know to not get too attached. Yes, there you go. <laughs> Thank so, you yeah. so much. Sure. Hello. Hey, how's it going, mate? Groovy. Hey, dude, what's your favorite episode as Gohan? Favorite episode is Gohan. Well, earlier I was saying that probably it's a moment, necessar not necessarily an episode, but during the Other World Tournament, he goes Super Saiyan 2. And um, everyone is just like picking their jaw off the floor because it's like they hadn't seen Gohan do that. You know, he's taking off the do rag and all that and just becoming that insanely powerful for the first time as a teenager or yeah. a young adult or however you want to call it. And it's like that is a moment that is like seared in my brain. That is just really, really cool. Sick, dude. Thanks. It's awesome. And hello. Hey there. Uh, my question is, is there any uh, animated show, whether it be anime or American cartoon, that you'd like to voice in? Either because you're a fan of it or like you've uh, heard good things. I would kill to be on Star Wars. Anything Star Wars. <laughs> Movies, TV shows, games. Now the Disney XD is, or sorry, the Disney Plus is going to have live action Star Wars series. Makes The Mandalorian and all that stuff. There are voice actors that will be employed to come in and voice like background things at some point. It's like, I hope I have an opportunity to at least read for that. That would be amazing. Cartoons is why I wanted to become a voice actor. So I very, very luckily made a career out of working in anime dubs and games. And I've done very minimal cartoon work, but it, I can say that from doing that, it's the most fun, it's the most rewarding because you're in the room with every actor. And it's like doing a radio play, and you get to watch everyone else's process and watch them screw up so you don't get so self-conscious when you screw up. And it's cool. And then a few years later, you see the animators, what they come up with, and it's like you see the marriage of the two. Finally, it's like that is so cool. But anime is also better in the respect that you see the final animation already, and you kind of already have an idea of what that marriage of the voice track and the, and the, and the video image are going to be. All you have to do then is just wait a few months and it comes out and see what the public says. Right. Yeah. All right, cool. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Other than that, watch Dragon Ball Super and everything else on Toonami. Chances are I'm probably in it. <laughs> is Hunter Hunter still on? Moral. I voiced Moral on that. What's that? Oh, yeah. JoJo Stardust Crusaders is over, so Kakuin's over, but... Part four just ended, okay. All right. Well, there's other stuff too. Naruto, Boruto. I'll come back in that as Kiba a couple times. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming and spending a little time with me today. Uh, I'll be back at the convention tomorrow and Sunday. Check the schedule for signing times. 
Um, come to the autograph session uh, at 11 a.m. tomorrow in the autographs hall. Autograph that. hall at 11 a.m. is when I'm starting. Yes. And if you purchased a photo op, that's where I'm going next, right? Yes. That's where I'm going now. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Yeah, awesome. Much love.